The Organ and the Organist. Simon Preston gives the fourth of a series of five programmes in which British organists talk about organs and discuss two of their favourite instruments. Simon Preston. The first organ I have chosen to talk about and illustrate is the organ at Westminster Abbey. I was sub-organist there between 1962 and 1967, and during that time I played for a large number of what could be described as occasions. There was a royal occasion, the wedding of Princess Alexandra. There was the 900th anniversary of the founding of the Abbey, numerous funerals of famous men and women, and countless memorial services. And in those days there had to be a service of thanksgiving for each country that was celebrating its independence from the ties of Great Britain. All this meant, of course, that a large amount of music that I played then was of a ceremonial nature, like the Marche Triomphale by Karg Eilert. The organ at the Abbey is a large and very grand machine. It was built in 1937 by Harrison and Harrison of Durham and was used for the first time at the coronation of King George VI in 1937. The organ is thoroughly orchestral in nature and totally suited to transcriptions and pieces such as the Karg Eilert. 
It is also an organ very much in the style of the romantic cathedral organ, where the acoustics of a particular building would do so much towards moulding the sound of the instrument and the style of playing. It is very similar in concept to the organ at King's College, Cambridge, from where I had just come, and also to the organ at Salisbury Cathedral, on which I had played occasionally when still at school. I found the organ at the Abbey very thrilling to play, although at that stage I had not played organs on the continent or in North America. However, it should perhaps be said that the organist gets the best impression of the instrument, seated as he is in the middle of the screen, with great and choir organs in the two cases either side of him, and swell and solo boxes up in the triforium. With diapasons on the grate, enclosed divisions for choir, swell and solo organs, an English full swell, tubers and orchestral trumpets on the solo, you would not, I hope, expect my second illustration of this organ to be a toccata by Frescobaldi or a movement from the Messe pour les paroisses by Couperin. Instead, I have chosen a romantic organ work, the Fantasia on Straf mich nicht in deinem Zorn by Max Reger. Both the organ and the music gave me ample opportunity to indulge in maximum orchestral effect and colouring, with crescendos and diminuendos achieved not only with the swell boxes, but also by setting all the manual pistons in a crescendo from one to eight. Both the layout of the organ and the reverberation of the building posed enormous problems for the engineers. But by miking up each division of the organ and careful mixing in the control room, they achieved a fine result. The other problem was more to do with the extremes of loudness and softness that the music demands. The abbey organ in that lofty building can certainly produce these wide dynamics. But simply no tape recorder, or for that matter no record player, is capable of reproducing the opening bar marked triple piano and the double forte a bar or so later on one dynamic level setting. Fortunately, the music is predominantly loud at the beginning and end, and predominantly soft in the central sections and very opening bars, so that we could record these quiet sections at a higher level to match the loud passages. The Fantasia on the chorale Straf mich nicht in deinem Zorn, Opus 40, number 2, was composed in 1899. The words of the chorale are a paraphrase of Psalm 6 by Johann Albinus, 1652. Rager uses six of the seven original verses and follows the text pretty closely with a set of elaborate variations on the chorale melody. The printed page always seems to me black with notes, partly because Rager chose to use the quaver as his main unit of time rather than the crotchet. In fact, I think Rager's organ music is not so much difficult technically as tiring physically. There always seem to be more notes in the chord than one has fingers for, and double pedalling just when the manual parts are in contrary motion. Another problem to do with the performance of this piece on the Abbey organ was deciding on the interpretation of Rager's registration marks, which are fairly numerous but not very explicit. He tends to tell the player what manual he should be on, and occasionally the pitch of the stops. It has to be remembered that the romantic German organ, with its concept of terraced dynamics, was a pretty ungainly musical instrument, although the general crescendo pedal, or Rollschwelle, did help towards smoother expressiveness. What I mean by this is that the German organist would add layers of sound by coupling manuals or pushing the crescendo pedal. On the Abbey organ, though, this had to be done by a lot of piston pressing, presetting a number of stops just when one was busiest with the notes of the music. Unfortunately, the Abbey organ was not over-endowed with general pistons either. Here, then, is the Fantasia on Straf mich nicht in deinem Zorn by Max Reger, as I recorded it on the organ of Westminster Abbey.
from Rega and the great organ at Westminster Abbey to something much smaller. This is the organ in Great Packington Parish Church. It only has two manuals with ten stops in all and no pedals. But for all its size, or lack of it, it has the remarkable distinction of having been designed by George Frederick Handel. In a letter to his friend Charles Jennings, the librettist of Messiah, Handel wrote, Sir, yesterday I received your letter, in answer to which I hereunder specify my opinion of an organ which I think will answer the ends you propose, being everything that is necessary for a good and grand organ, without reed stops, which I have omitted, because they are continually wanting to be tuned, which in the country is very inconvenient. And should it remain useless on that account, it would still be very expensive, although that may not be your consideration. I very well approve of Mr. Bridge, who without any objection is a very good organ builder, and I shall willingly, when he has finished it, give you my opinion of it. The letter then goes on to give a detailed specification and ends with these words. I am glad of the opportunity to show you my attention. Wishing you all health and happiness, I remain with great sincerity and respect. Sir, your most obedient and most humble servant, George Frederick Handel. London, September 30th, 1749. The Mr. Bridge mentioned in the letter was Richard Bridge, a well-known organ builder who had built the organ in Christchurch Spitalfields in 1730, then the largest in England. However, in 1792, the organ was moved from Jennings House, Gopsall Hall, to the music room at Packington Hall in Warwickshire, the home of the present Earl of Aylesford and later moved to its present position in Great Packington Parish Church on the estate. Strangely enough, despite Handel's letter, we are not absolutely sure who built this organ. A later discovery in pencil inside the keyboard would suggest that Thomas Parker was the builder and not Bridge. The second manual was later added by Schnetzler, probably to Handel's own specification. After my years at Westminster Abbey, playing for ceremonial occasions as well as for daily services, it was a splendid contrast to turn to the organ concertos of Handel, which I was asked to record with the Yehudi Menuhin and the Festival Orchestra. Because of the associations of the great Packington organ with Charles Jennings, the librettist of Messiah, I have chosen the concerto Opus 7, Number 3 in B-flat, which of course has the opening movement based on the two main themes of the Hallelujah Chorus from Messiah. This was Handel's last organ concerto, and probably his last instrumental work. As is now generally well known, Handel composed his organ concertos for use as overtures, or entr'actes, in his London oratorios. At first the solo parts, and even whole movements, were improvised, but gradually they were written out and assumed the form that we have them in today. Handel, for what it is worth, could be said to have invented the organ concerto. On March the 1st, 1751, he performed The Choice of Hercules, with what the Daily Post described as a new concerto on the organ. It must have been this one. After the first movement, Handel wrote Adagio e fuga ad libitum. However, it's doubtful whether he really wanted an ad lib fugue as well as an adagio ad lib, because the next movement, marked spiritoso, itself begins fugally. In any case, I have inserted the air lentement from the Aylesford manuscript. The concerto ends with a minuet. There are two printed, but the second, without organ, was included by mistake. Handel's organ concerto, opus 7, number 3 in B flat. The movements are allegro, air lentement, spiritoso, and minuet. <laughs>
Handel's Organ Concerto, Opus 7, Number 3, which I played with the Yehudi Menuhin and the Festival Orchestra and recorded it in Great Packington Church. For my last illustration, I returned to the organ in Westminster Abbey. But continuing the link with Handel, we have the march on a theme of Handel by Guillemot, the theme being, of course, Lift Up Your Heads from Messiah.
Simon Preston's programme, the fourth in a series entitled The Organ and the Organist, ended with him playing March on a Theme of Handel by Guillemont. Next week, the organist will be Nicholas Danby.